Christopher Nolan is undeniably one of the most important and influential directors working in the world today. Are you watching closely? He has made an enormous impact on cinema, not only through his cinematic achievements, but also through his behind the scenes contributions. With The Dark Knight, for example, Nolan became one of the first directors to shoot a significant portion of a feature film with IMAX cameras. He is a vocal proponent of using film stock, and he is also an advocate of physical media and its importance in an increasingly digital age. I think the, the home video versions of my films, the definitive versions are the Blu-ray and the 4K versions because there's much less compression, there's very specific authoring, we control the colour of the picture, the, the brightness, you know, all these things. When you stream a film, it's like broadcasting a film. We don't have much control over how it goes out. And also, you know, being able to hold it in your hand and see the artwork and the posters and have the names, it's, uh, you know, it's a real thing. Overall, I have a huge admiration for Nolan as an artist. With his works being so accessible, they serve as a perfect springboard for many into the wonderful and vast world of cinema. The current landscape would look much different if Nolan wasn't in it and there is always immense buzz for anything he is involved in. Oppenheimer was one of 2023's most anticipated films, and it did not disappoint. In many ways, it felt like a return to form for Nolan, and it's my favourite film of his since Interstellar. Oppenheimer was an incredible exploration of one of humanity's most tragic and significant individuals, and is easily one of the best films that released last year. There are many aspects of the film that I could praise, from its score and sound design, to its performances and cinematography. But there is one aspect that I would like to draw particular attention to here, and that is the average shot length. During the Trinity test, the average shot length is extremely small, and there are a total of 8 shots spliced together in just 7 seconds. This is a very interesting stylistic choice and it made me curious about Nolan's average shot length outside of Oppenheimer, which supposedly comes in at around 3.1 seconds. This may seem low, but actually it's slightly above average in the current landscape of film, where the average shot is usually around 2.5 seconds, a number that has been declining since the 1930s, when the average shot length used to be around 12 seconds. I think it's a real shame that there has been this continual decline in average shot length, as when I look at the directors and films I admire the most, they always lean on the longer side of things. In a world as frenetic as Hong Kong, Wong Kar Wai still keeps his shots longer, within the mood for love's average shot length even exceeding 10 seconds. Kubrick, who is one of Nolan's key influences, also opted for an average shot length of over 10 seconds. Then there are directors who push things even further and branch into the genre of slow cinema. Andrei Tarkovsky, who many would consider to be the master of all slow cinema, had an average shot length of over a minute in his final three films. Slow cinema is certainly a dying genre, so it is incredibly refreshing to see new voices emerge within this space. China has produced some truly spectacular slow cinema films that I have discovered in recent years. Take 2018's An Elephant Sitting Still, directed by Hu Boa, for example. A film I have already covered here on the channel, but one that I still believe to be among the greatest of the 21st century so far. Released in the same year from China was another gem of slow cinema, and that film was none other than A Long Day's Journey Into Night, directed by Began. Despite being only 34 years old and releasing just two feature films, Began has already established himself as a cinematic visionary and one of Chinese cinema's most promising prospects. In his first feature film, Kai Li Blues, Began hit the ground running with his fresh and unique style, but it was with A Long Day's Journey Into Night that he truly showcased his talents. The film is an expansion in just about every possible way, and what we are left with is a truly remarkable work. The film follows Luo Hongwu as he returns to his hometown of Kaili after being away for a long time. Almost immediately, 
he begins the search for the woman he loved and whom he has never been able to forget. A Long Day's Journey Into Night feels like a film that Tarkovsky and Wong Kar Wai co-directed, but even then it stands entirely on its own. The film is split into two halves, with the first half providing the main exposition of the story. Within this first half of the film, we follow Luo across two timelines, one in the year 2000, where he recalls his relationship with the woman he loved, and one in the present, where he seeks to find the woman, who is notably played by the brilliant Tang Wei. You may recognise her from Lust Caution, or more recently 2022's Decision to Leave. Good morning. Memories mix both truth and lies, and in a way, a long day's journey in tonight acts as a cinematic puzzle. As we witness these fragments of memory, we are left trying to decipher not only what we see, but also what we remember. Every scene, every long take that comes and goes only deepens this illusion. The whole experience of watching this film is completely surreal. But what truly sets a long day's journey into night apart is its second half. When Luo enters a movie theatre, he falls asleep and we enter his dreams. The title card is shown, and what we are introduced to is a single long take that lasts for 59 minutes. Knowing this fact going into the film, I expected the long take to be situated in a small area, but I was completely wrong. The take consists of different locations, both internal and external, different rates of motion, and even flight. All I could think watching this was how the did Began pull this incredible cinematic feat off? According to an IndieWire article, Began spent two months preparing for the long take, working with cinematographer David Chiselet to develop a rig that could carry their RED camera through multiple environments. A hook was built onto the rig so that a crane could attach itself to the camera at just the right moment. This moment I am referring to is when the ping pong racket bearing the image of a bird is spun and the camera takes flight. The first two attempts to perform the long take were interrupted by various technical challenges. After an additional five takes, Began finally pulled it off and used the last or seventh overall take for the final cut of the film. The entire sequence was shot in 2D and converted to 3D in post-production because a 2D camera was lighter and therefore easier to move in difficult positions and small environments. Unfortunately, I have never had the pleasure to see the long take in 3D, but even in 2D, it is still spectacular to watch. Began's next film will be a sci-fi one titled Resurrection, which I absolutely cannot wait for. In conclusion, Shot length has a huge impact on the viewer's experience. Every cut that is made, or isn't made, creates a different effect. I believe a shot has no fixed or optimum length, and should be what it needs to be, and this will vary drastically depending on the genre of the film, its tone, and its overall direction. However, I also would like to see more directors experiment with longer takes, and defy the trend of the declining average shot length. While it doesn't need to be as long or ambitious as what Began has achieved, sometimes it's nice to observe the flow of real time. There is something very magical about a longer take and it deserves more representation in cinema, now more than ever before.